this week on Waterways. The Wellwood Restoration and Wild Dolphin Encounters. Nineteen eighty four, six miles southeast of Key Largo, Florida. An SOS went out announcing the motor vessel Wellwood, a hundred and twenty two meter freighter carrying pelletized chicken feed, had run aground on Molasses Reef. The result? Catastrophic damage done to the reef proper, its framework, and every living coral in the area. The reef was flattened, pulverized. Essentially, it was navigational error. It was in the middle of the night, near midnight, and the uh, lookout reported that he saw a sailboat on the horizon. That sailboat turned out to be the light at Molasses Reef. The damaged reef was part of the Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary, which would later become part of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. The total destruction from the grounding included 5,805 square meters of living corals and injury to 75,000 square meters of reef habitat. Due to complications with removal, the ship remained on the reef for 12 days. When they uh, were trying to pull the ship off, unfortunately the, the salvers uh, back then uh, were just using steel cables instead of floating lines and that did uh, <laughs> tremendous damage, uh, not just at the site, but out in the deeper water. And uh, that injury we'll probably really never know the full extent of. The cables would fall to the seafloor and then get pulled, and just like a giant scythe, we're cutting off giant sponges and coral heads in the deeper water. So it was all in all, it was about as bad as it can get. When we first went down to the site, um it's pretty barren compared to the rest of Molasses Reef, which is a beautiful, high-profile spur and groove system. Uh, that grounding site was pretty flat, certainly nowhere near the topography and the relief that the rest of Molasses Reef has. Many organizations pitched in to help mitigate the damage, but unlike reefs damaged by hurricanes, there were not many corals to transplant or rescue. Of course, you couldn't do anything. Uh, you couldn't really fix anything because there was nothing left out there to fix. Uh, it seems that every living coral uh, in and under the ship was uh, just completely uh, disintegrated. Thus launched the Wellwood Restoration Project. Beginning with recovery efforts by the U.S. Coast Guard and NOAA, it was soon apparent the reef needed serious work. This would be a wound that nature could not heal on its own. This injury was so catastrophic that nature can't fix these kinds of injuries because when the ship hit the reef and then the great weight of the ship came to bear on the framework, it, it totally fractured the underlying framework and that essentially broke the back of the reef. Whenever a grounding occurs within a National Marine Sanctuary, NOAA can seek damages to cover response, injury and damage assessment, restoration and replacement of the damaged habitat, or acquisition of equivalent habitat as well as the cost of removing the vessel. Like everything in life, it seems, it was a matter of money. Uh, in this case, we, we did receive uh, a large amount of money, uh, $6.2 million, uh, for the restoration, uh, monitoring work, and of course all of the response that went into getting the ship off. Unfortunately, that money was paid out over time, in fact, 15 years, so we had to wait patiently, or impatiently in my case, uh, for the monies to build up. Almost 18 years passed between the grounding and when Harold Hudson and his team were ready to proceed with the restoration of the Wellwood site. 
it was evident early on that the framework of the reef needed to be reconstructed. Without the hard substrate for corals to grow and settle upon, the area would remain a barren parking lot. As the years have gone on and I've been observing uh, other uh, restorations that I've done and watched the evolution of these sites, uh, both negative and positive things about these restorations, uh, that has enabled me to uh, create a, uh, if you will, a better mousetrap, a, a better artificial reef structure, and really that is pretty much culminated in the, uh, the design and the uh, modules that were made for the, uh, the Wellwood restoration site. The repair of the site was concentrated on 14 excavation craters caused by Hurricane George in 1998. The original damage caused by the freighter had been exacerbated by the storms. The solution? Construct limestone and cement modules and cement them to the seafloor as a permanent replacement for the reef framework. We chose uh, limestone and concrete uh, for two very fundamental reasons. Uh, they're cost-effective materials. Uh, the, the chemical makeup of both materials is essentially the same as the coral reef. Uh, the limestone boulders uh, were made uh, in the oceans uh, thousands of years ago, but, but fundamentally uh, they're the same uh, limestone that the reef is constructed of. And of course, uh, we need something to hold these rocks, these limestone boulders together, and that's where the, the concrete comes in. We had a 140-foot barge with a crane, and on the barge we had the, uh, the stacked modules, and most importantly we had uh, a team of hard hat commercial divers that were used to handling uh, heavy equipment and uh, used to dealing with uh, large heavy objects on the seafloor. The modules were lowered into the craters and then leveled in such a way that the concrete base of the module was leveled with the seafloor. That left the limestone part projecting above the reef, creating a three-dimensional structure. And once these were leveled and in place, uh, termy concrete, that is concrete that was pumped from the barge through a hose uh, down to the modules, and they were completely encircled and encapsulated uh, in the concrete, that is the foundation, the base of the module was, was literally locked into the reef with concrete. And believe me, uh, those units are stronger than the original reef structure itself. Instant gratification is not often coupled with science, the Wellwood restoration quickly proved effective. Even as the crew finished the restoration in July of 2002, fish were coming in and checking out their new home. We started monitoring the initial placement modules uh, less than two weeks after they were put down on the bottom. And then, of course, we monitored those as the restoration effort was completed. Then we went into a monthly monitoring regime, quarterly monitoring regime, and now we're into annual monitoring. And we started noticing, even after the very first modules were placed, a change in the fish assemblages at the site. Anytime a new structure is placed underwater, it's a perfect opportunity to recruit uh, new benthic growth. And those modules really attracted a different kind of algae species than the mature reef was, uh, was providing. 
So the fish that fed on that algae, namely the, the surgeon fish, really came in and um, the numbers of those surgeon fish just blossomed during the initial stages of the uh, restoration. The Reef Environmental Education Foundation is responsible for monitoring fish populations at the Wellwood site over a five-year period. By July of 2003, soft corals, small amounts of fire coral, and several hundred reef fish have taken up residence in and around the structures. The restoration was a success, but at what cost? The labor and materials uh, for us to construct the modules here at the sanctuary uh, amounted to around between $2,500 and $3,000 per module. And you, you must understand that that is strictly the fabrication cost. You have the transport cost, uh, taking the modules from here to uh, Miami to, to load on a barge, and then the barge has to come down to, to Key Largo. So there's, this is just really the tip of the iceberg on the costing. That iceberg also included reimbursing the Coast Guard and NOAA salvage expenses, as well as the cost of extensive damage assessment. But the real cost was to the natural ecosystem that had now become functional, but artificial. I think there is a difference between the module and the real reef. I mean, the, the idea as I understand it was not to completely recreate the reef. Part of it was to stabilize the substrate and keep it from sloshing about every time we had a storm. And another part was to give back some of the complexity that used to be there. Now I think that is starting to happen. And we're starting to see fish recruiting into those modules um, and using that complexity that weren't there during the initial stages of the restoration effort. And I think as it matures, we're going to see more and more of that. It, it's been pretty well demonstrated by other, other reef fish scientists that the larger the structure in general, uh, the more apt you are to draw in larger uh, and, and more fish, of course, because the habitat is bigger. So we have a way to go. And we'll, we'll be out there designing and working. Visitors to Molasses Reef will be hard pressed to identify which relief are modules and which is authentic coral reef substrate. Algae, corals, sponges, and reef fish, it seems, can't tell the difference. Or maybe they're simply making the best of their new home. All dolphins filmed in this segment were shot in accordance with NOAA Marine Mammal Viewing Guidelines or in conjunction with permitted research projects. All underwater footage was shot using captive dolphins. Rarely has any animal fueled the imagination and passions of people more than dolphins. Fellow mammal, extremely intelligent, with streamlined grace, dolphins contribute to the allure of the Florida Keys bringing thousands of visitors to see them in the wild. Well, um, if you're out in your boat um, and you are approached by dolphins, that's one of the coolest things that you could ever have happen. And the best thing to do um, to be safe for the dolphins is to put your engine in neutral, cut back on the engine, and just sit and watch them. And it's actually really amazing what the dolphins will do. Um, a lot of times they'll um, swim and play around your boat, and they're really interested and they're very curious, and so they'll want to see what's going on. The experience of seeing dolphins in their native habitat is exciting and an increasing number of visitors to Florida are seeking such nature-based experiences. The rising interest in nature-based tourism has led to an increase in wild dolphin viewing charters as well as dolphin viewing from private boats in many of Florida's coastal communities. Well, it's becoming a really important issue because the coastal human population is growing rapidly and people are becoming more interested in nature-based tourism. And so as people want to go out and see nature more, they're going to encounter dolphins in the wild more. And what we're finding is that people really want to have a natural experience. 
With the increased number of recreational and charter boats viewing dolphins in the wild, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has been forced to set guidelines to protect the animals. To ensure the safety of both humans and wild dolphins, NOAA recommends that boats maintain a distance of at least 150 feet. The best way to gauge what 150 feet is, is to think about it in terms of your actual boat length. And so if you're out in a 20-foot boat, just think of it as, you know, seven and a half boat lengths. Um, and that's the best way to think about it is approximate it based on what your actual boat length is. Keep your movement parallel to them and try to move from behind. That way you don't scare them by moving head on or by driving right at them. Occasionally, a boat may be 150 feet or more away, but curious dolphins swim closer to investigate. When this happens, keep the boat in neutral or cut the engine and enjoy the experience. When dolphins leave, do not pursue them, as pursuit is considered under the Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act to be a form of harassment and is therefore illegal. NOAA is starting a program called Dolphin Aware Tour Operator and this is actually a program where operators go through kind of a training course, it's an educational program where they learn about viewing guidelines, they learn how to responsibly view dolphins in the wild and after they go through that there's a designation that goes on their boat and on their brochures that actually lets tourists know this operator knows how to act responsibly, this operator knows what the viewing guidelines are and what the Marine Mammal Protection Act says. Popular images of dolphins cause many people to have unrealistic expectations when viewing dolphins in the wild. Private boaters, tourists, or commercial tour operators may mistakenly think feeding or swimming with wild dolphins is acceptable, even desired on the part of the dolphin. These people may not be prepared to appreciate a truly wild experience involving a healthy respect for wild animals. Um, one of the things we're finding with people that want to go out and see dolphins is that they're often misled by the pictures that the media and the television programs have painted of dolphins over the past few decades. And a lot of people are used to seeing Flipper on television, and this is an image that we constantly have to remind people. Flipper, first of all, wasn't only one dolphin, he was a couple of dolphins, and he was a captive dolphin. And dolphins in the wild don't act like Flipper. Um, they don't love to be around people. They don't love to give people rides on their dorsal fins. Um, they don't love to talk to you and eat the food that you eat. Wild dolphins and flipper are very, very different animals. It is best if visitors don't have any preconceived notions about wild dolphin encounters. Images of handlers tossing sardines into the open mouths of captive dolphins are widespread, and one of the biggest dangers that wild dolphins face is when humans feed them. dolphins are fed on a continual basis, they forget how to hunt and they also don't teach their calves how to hunt. So we have mother-calf pairs that are learning to beg for a living and they no longer know how to be wild dolphins. Most of the food that is fed to wild dolphins is not in their natural diet. Hot dogs, potato chips, and sandwiches are not naturally found in Keys waters and do not provide the water or nutritional content found in their natural prey items. Even feeding wild dolphins fish can make them ill, as these fish may be contaminated, spoiled, or otherwise unfit for consumption by wild dolphins. And the main problem that we're having is that when people go out fishing and they have bait on the boat, lots of times the bait spoils and they feed dolphins bait and then the dolphins get sick afterward. And on top of that, it's also illegal um, under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And so we don't want people to get fined, but we're also doing it for the safety of the dolphins. It can make them very ill and it does make them more susceptible to getting injured by humans. Uh, they start associating food with boats and with people. When illegally fed wild dolphins hear a boat approaching, it can sound like a dinner bell. Boaters may not be looking for dolphins, and if the dolphins approach a boat unnoticed, boat strikes may occur.
Dolphins actually can get hit by boats just like manatees. And one of the things that you might actually see in pictures is that dolphins can have prop scars just like manatees. You'll see a series of, of parallel scars on their backs. Um, the other thing that you might see are scars on their dorsal fins from where they've been hit by boats. And when dolphins are confronted with a number of boats viewing them at the same time, when they're surrounded or when they're not provided with an escape route, it actually does place a lot of pressure on the dolphins. If there are multiple boats viewing a pod of dolphins, the dolphins should never be surrounded. Always leave an escape route to allow the dolphins to leave the area if they feel trapped, threatened, or scared. In addition, the increased number of people viewing dolphins, whether on commercial charters or private recreational boats, may translate into increased stress for wild dolphins, as some of these viewers may not be informed of the NOAA Fisheries Viewing Guidelines and the law under the MMPA. As a result, both the dolphins and the people can be put at risk of injury. In the past few years, dozens of people have been bitten or pulled underwater while swimming with wild dolphins. But also when you jump in the water and swim with dolphins, you're interrupting what the dolphins are doing. And it's not a very good way to view them in their natural habitat. If you want to get the natural experience of seeing wild dolphins in the wild, the best thing to do is to stay on your boat, um, keep your hands out of the water, and just sit back and watch what the dolphins are doing naturally. Swimming with wild dolphins is against NOAA's marine mammal viewing guidelines and operators advertising swim with wild dolphin charters should be viewed with skepticism, as these activities may result in harassment and therefore would be in violation of the MMPA. Responsible commercial operators realize that it's in their best interest to protect rather than exploit wild dolphin populations. Customers can help protect wild dolphins by choosing responsible operators that will provide you with a natural viewing experience while respecting the wild dolphins. One of the best ways for people to actually protect and conserve wild dolphins is to choose their operators that they go out with responsibly. Um, the more that operators know people are looking for wild and responsible experiences with wild dolphins, the more they will want to provide these experiences. Uh, the less people want to feed wild dolphins, the less people want to swim with wild dolphins, the less operators will actually offer this as an option to customers. NOAA recommends that both private and charter boats limit their viewing time to 30 minutes. Keep in mind that your vessel may not be the only one to view the dolphins that day, and the impact on dolphins from vessel traffic is likely cumulative. Also remember that your departure from viewing wild dolphins can be as disruptive as your arrival. Leave the area slowly and quietly remembering to keep the experience as natural and unobtrusive as possible, remembering that when you're viewing dolphins in the wild, you're the visitor in their home.